Church. I'm your brother Kasafo. No, your brother Zakwa. Hope you all are enjoying this Shabbat day. We thank you all for taking the time to join us and taking the time also to watch the lessons, share the lessons, and work on the things that you're learning in the lessons to help yourselves and also help others by having an example of a believer. Anything before we get going, Zakwa? I'm ready, brother. All right. We're going to be here for a while today. <laughs> so if you hadn't, make sure get on the website, download the PDF notes, or on the Sabbath days, join us on Zoom where we go through the lessons together. And um, hopefully this is helpful with building off of where we've been going with the mind body and senses learning our purpose and then learning the sins of youth that we have to overcome or what's against us and today we're continuing in that understanding of understanding spiritual fornication and idolatry this is going to be a really good discussion really good insight and perspective to help us for our focus and understanding our enemies so that we can be harmless as doves though we're wise understanding that serpent <laughs> all right uh idolatry and unlawful images let's get into this here since abraham the father of all nations that believe sincerely desires us to keep from fornication in every respect let's look into it and understand it in all respects zach what can you read wisdom of solomon chapter 14 verse 12 please for well, the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication. So, the thought of idols as our deities was the beginning of spiritual fornication. Why was this the beginning of spiritual fornication? Can you read Isaiah 54 and 5, please? For thy maker is thine husband. Hebrew has more meaning so we can understand. The word husband is this word is still in yoruba today to help know that the bantu is hebrew the word bale or bale depending on how you pronounce it changes the meaning of it and it's a primitive root to be master and to rule over possess own so when it says thy maker is thine husband ahaya of hosts continue please aqua <laughs> sorry Ahaya of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the Elohim of the whole earth, shall he be called. So, our maker, Ahaya of hosts, maker of Jerusalem and her children, and the children are married unto him as well by covenant, according to Jeremiah 3 and 14 and Ezekiel 16 and 8. So, he made his family as his possession under his rule and ownership as Lord. This is why the body is for the Lord, its creator, and not for fornication. So even the thought to have another spirit or entity as our Allahayim, or our deity, if you will, is spiritual fornicating against him, since we are seeking after another head over us. Interesting, you can see that from the beginning, because when Cain was wroth and his countenance was falling he was heartening to idols and Allah Hayyam told him um sorry i'm touching on this because of that understanding dominion when we get into another spirit it's mm -hmm. taking dominion over us though we're supposed to be under the lord's dominion in Genesis 4 and 7, he has said, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? 
And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So the Spirit was right there. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. When he gave into his emotions, sin actually ruled over him. So we can know when we go after another, give heed to their thoughts. We're going under another dominion away from our maker. Okay. And building on that, it shows in our countenance, as Zachua mentioned in the lesson about paying attention. What was that? Anger lesson about paying attention to our countenance or pride, probably? I think it was anger. Okay. We have to pay attention to our countenance to catch ourselves and see, hold on, this is someone else's dominion because of how I'm reacting, how I'm feeling. That's not the dominion of my maker. Can you read Psalms 10 and 4, please? The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after Allah. Allah is not in all his thoughts. So... The reason the devising of idols was spiritual fornication is because that thought or imagination came from spirits contrary to Allah. So the thinking up or entertaining of thoughts of other spirits as our deity is fornication in spirit. Now, when we acted on the thoughts from the other spirits, let's see what happened when our countenance changed. Someone else is in our thoughts. What comes from that? Wisdom of Solomon 14 and 12, please. And the invention of them, the corruption of life. Once we acted on the thoughts from the idols to have our own deities, we would then invent a physical character, whether an actual figure or the concept, and the idol will give us the customs to go with that idol. Mind you, the thought of being deities ourselves falls under this idolatry because the devil from the beginning used that concept to lead us astray. So knowing it was an evil entity that leads us to all this, once we invent them, whether the concept or image to go with the physical invention, it corrupts our life that was in keeping the commandments of Allah because that other spirit that led to the evil thought and invention is meant to lead us astray. We have an example to look at as before the flood, it happened in Joshua chapter 2 to see what happens when spiritual fornication is at work. Can you read Joshua 2 verse 3 to 5 please? And it was in the days of Enos. But the sons of men continued to rebel and transgress against Allah, to increase the anger of Ahiah against the sons of men. And the sons of men went, and they served other Allah, and they forgot Ahiah who had created them in the earth. Spiritual fornication and forgetting the Holy One who created us to be joined unto other deities, serving them by evidence of rebelling and transgressing against Allah. Continue, please. And in those days, the sons of men made images of brass and iron, wood and stone, and they bowed down and served them. And every man made his Allah, and they bowed down to them. Once in spiritual fornication, devising our own deities, the unlawful images get made according to every man's desire. Continue, please. And the sons of men forsook Ahiah all the days of Enos and his children. When spiritual fornication is done, it's a forsaken of Ahaya, as every man has his own deity and or image of that deity to trust in. Continue, please. And the anger of Ahaya was kindled on account of their works and abominations which they did in the earth. Spiritual fornication didn't please him from the beginning. We can also look at how it happened after the flood to confirm what we're understanding to know. Evil entities lead us to invent deities and or literal idols in different types of unlawful images which corrupt our actual lives. Let's see by precept after the flood that it's evil spirits leading us to do these things in spiritual fornication so we can remember not to make 
or invent deities, nor make unlawful images ourselves, nor worship them. Uh, Jubilees 11 and 4, please. And they made for themselves molten images, and they worshipped each the idol, the molten image which they had made for themselves. There's a spiritual fornication we talked about that they followed through on to make molten images and also to worship them. All right. And they began to make graven images and unclean simulacra. They also made carved images and unclean pictures. For understanding regarding unclean simulacra and how they are unclean pictures and what types of pictures are clean versus unclean, visit the law class lesson, Are Pictures Lawful?, as well as the website tab of the same title for further edification. Continue reading, please. And malignant spirits assisted and seduced them into mm -hmm. committing transgression and uncleanness. When new deities are invented, or unlawful images are made or worshipped. It's spiritual mm -hmm. fornication as we are being assisted and seduced by evil spirits to do so. This helps understand, as Psalms 10 and 4 said, Allah wasn't in all our thoughts to go commit transgression and uncleanness because an evil spirit seduced and assisted us to do the evil. Knowing the spirit of fornication is at work in unlawful image making, we ought not to make, love, or be deceived to worship or desire after unlawful images or idols. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon chapter 15, verse 4 to 6, please? Mm -hmm. But neither did the mischievous invention of men deceive us, nor an image spotted with diverse colors. The painter's fruitless labor. The sight whereof enticeth fools to lust after it. And so they desire the form of a dead image that hath no breath. Both they that make them, and they that desire them, and they that worship them, are lovers of evil things, and are worthy to have such things to trust upon. So be mindful of even being enticed unto desire or taking pleasure in the random and lawful images of people and creatures that are around us daily, lest we be found lovers of evil things before Allah Hayyam, and don't worship them either, of course. Hopefully that helps for a reminder on unlawful images and understanding the spiritual fornication that goes into it even when we have a desire for them, not just making them, worshiping them, or serving them living according to their customs and doctrines. Hopefully thus far we understand it is spiritual fornication to think up idols or make idols or worship them or serve them in their respective religions amongst any nation, including the idols of the unbelievers of Israel, as even struggling Israelites have established their own righteousness and deities of old time unto present day. Now, is there any evidence that it's an evil spirit that leads men to have other mm -hmm. deities aside from Ahaya, Alahayim upon the earth? Let's look into it. Now we're going to transition into looking at the spirits of world religions. Sakwa, if you will, Testament of Solomon chapter 27, please. Testament of Solomon chapter 27. I, Solomon, said unto him, Beelzebul, what is thy employment? And he answered me, My own demons I set on to men, in order that the latter may believe in them and be lost. So demons are believed on for the sake of men being lost. But how so? Chapter 61, please. And the spirit answered and said, this is the first time I have stood before thee, O King Solomon. I am a spirit made into an Alahim among men. The demons, these demonic spirits, they become men's deities and lead men astray. Demons know in these latter times they shall be held as deities amongst mankind, 
and the end purpose for us is so that we will be lost. Continue in chapter 21, please. And I at once bade another demon to be led unto me. And instantly there approached me the demon Asmodeus, bound, and I asked him, Who art thou? Solomon asked him who he is. Asmodeus had responded in a manner that wasn't well, but then he's now responding to Solomon to tell him that whatever what you're about to do, we're going to have our time in the end of the world. That's what we're reading into now. Please, Zachary. And short will be thy tyranny over us, and then we shall again have free range over mankind, so as that they shall revere us as if we were Elohims, not knowing, men that they are, the names of the angels set over us. Remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and 20 that the Gentiles sacrifice unto devils? It was literal. As in the scriptures, we see the demons really are revered as deities, though they truly are not. So we really should come out of their religions in the world, their feast and their sacrifices, even as Paul doesn't want us having fellowship with devils. Also, understand the power of names actually matter. By evidence of the angels' names over these demons, frustrate them. We will come back to the power of names after we finish this understanding of the spirits behind the deities and religions of the world. Now, continuing on understanding the deities of the Gentiles is spiritual fornication in idolatry because their deities are not good spirits. We today in America live after the Greek culture from their deities to which the Romans parallel their culture and deities. This stems from the wrong spirits, as is demons behind their deities and practices in Scripture. Can you read Testament of Solomon 64, please? And there came before my face another spirit, as it were a woman in the form she had. But on her shoulders she had two other heads with hands. And I asked her and said, Tell me, who art thou? And she said to me, I am in nuptials, who also have a myriad names. So notice one demon can go by many names. Therefore, you have cases like Astaroth and Astarte, the queen mother of heaven, where there may be different names, but referring to the same deity. Right? And I said her, By what angel art thou frustrated? And she said to me, What seekest? What askest thou? I undergo changes, like the female deity I am called. So as time goes by, this deity changes its form as a woman goes through different stages in her life. Continue, please. And I change again and pass into possession of another shape. She shape shifts, so she's not always as she appears. Continue, please. And be not desirous, therefore, to know all that concerns me. But since thou art before me for this much, hearken. I have my abode in the moon, and for that reason I possess three forms. At times I am magically invoked, by the wise as Kronos. At other times, in connection with those who bring me down, I come down and appear in another shape. Kronos is the alleged father of the Olympians and king of the Titans in Greek mythology. Yet, is this demon that's being invoked magically, so witchcraft is involved in Greek religion. Though Kronos is said to be a man, Remember, this demon shapeshifts, so she is actually changing her kind into a man, which kind of sheds light on the same kind relations the Greeks were known for, seeing as though the spirits they worship were into that business. The Greek polytheism heavily involves Mount Olympus, and that is a place where demons reside at times to understand their religion truly comes from idols. 
We also get to see why moon worship is idolatry, seeing the spirits leading us to do it, and the true moon spirit would never provoke us to worship it, being in subjection to Allah Hayyam. Whenever you're ready, Zakwa. The um it also uh touches on the changing of kind. So you can see that we actually are picking up uh, as far as the world, the world is actually picking up customs from or or things that they're putting in place from these demons. This is where they're getting the ideas to actually change their kind from a man to a woman and so forth and so on, because that's how some of these demons are and they put their spirit into them. And that's when they start actually replicating what the demons actually do. Um, and also it shows forth uh, when it said that she has her abode in the moon. And for that reason, she possesses three forms. So um, for a lot of people, um, once you see anyone that uh, symbolizes the moon as far as their beliefs or their religion, you automatically should understand that, hey, there is a demon attached to that. So that we can actually understand. Because Allah Hayim, we we don't reverence the moon in any of our worships or as a symbol of our worship so that you can actually understand that. I'm done, Kasa. Praise Allah for that understanding. In another lesson, we're going to actually get into discussing the different manifestations of these spirits in the world, like what Zach was talking about, same kind and such. You want me to continue in 34? Please. And there came seven spirits, females, bound and woven together, fair in appearance and comely. And I, Solomon, seeing them, questioned them and said, Who are ye? But they, with one accord, said with one voice, We are the 36 elements of the cosmic ruler of the darkness, and our stars are in heaven. Seven stars, humble and sheen, and all together. We are all called, as it were, female deities. That shows evil spirits behind star worship and viewing them as deities when they're just stars. Okay? All right, continue, please. We change our place all in together, and together we live, sometimes in Lydia, sometimes in Olympus, sometimes in a great mountain. Hopefully, that suffices for the time being to understand religions and deities truly come from evil spiritual beings to lead us astray from the example of the Greek deities and places of their deities' dwellings and the lifestyle that's manifested in how their deities operate or what their deities have pleasure in that actually linked to the wrong side of this battle that we're in for our life. And it's not just the Greeks, which are the children of Javan, and it's not just the Romans, which are the children of Chittim, we ought not to follow. It's not just them, because they are spirits of authority over the heathen, from the Tower of Babel to lead them astray from Allah Hayyam. So in their respective religions amongst the Gentiles and anyone who follows them, their doctrines are vanities and their customs are vain because they are coming from those misleading spirits, unfortunately. Can you read Jubilees 15, verse 31 and 32, please? For there are many nations and many peoples, and all are his, and over all, hath he placed spirits and authority to lead them astray from him. But over Israel he did not appoint any angel or spirit, for he alone is their ruler. Israel didn't have an angel or spirit over them to lead them astray from Ahia, because Ahia is their ruler, and they are his portion. So the true religion and custom of the Jews in spirit and truth outlined in the law, testimonies, and the fruits of the law, 
is the right way to live, as Paul spake of the Gentiles living according to the manner of the Jews, in faith to Yache, being holy, without spot, walking in love to fulfill all of the law. It isn't because the Jews are better than anyone. It's just that Israel is the Lord's portion because of his love for the fathers and his oath with them. So his true religion is known in the Israel of Allahim, walking in the spirit since he gave them his law of life and knowledge. Can you read Sirach 17, 17, please? For in the division of the nations of the whole earth, he set a ruler over every people. But Israel is the Lord's portion. Every ruler has his doctrine and law. So if one wants to walk according to the doctrine and law of the Lord of heaven, one has to live after the man of the true Jews, who he revealed his way unto. Can you read Sirach 17 and 11, please? Beside this, he gave them knowledge and the law of life for an heritage. Unlike the idols of the heathen, who are the spirits of authority to lead them astray from Alahayim by the doctrines of vanities and vain customs? Ahaya Alahayim, the ruler of Israel, gave them knowledge and the law of life and heritage to keep them near unto him through Yache, the horn of Israel. Can you read Psalms 148.14, please? He also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye Yah. Praise ye Yah. In Hebrew, that's Halolo Yah, if you ever look and wanted to know how to say it. In Hebrew, the horn means power and a ray of light when you look at the Strong's definition. And Yache is that light being exalted and that power that upholds and causes Israel to stand in righteousness. You can refer to the Testament of Dan when he speaks how that angel is actually who's going to cause uh, Israel to stand. Understanding this, he is the praise of the true Israelites that are near unto Allah by keeping his law in lowliness as it is his spirit prospering them as Allah sent him to do. All this is worthy of praise in Yah, Ahaya, Allah as it is his will being done. Mind you, the commandments bring people near by keeping them, but lowliness and humility gets his respect. So the fruits of his ways are required to be accepted of him. Can you read Psalms 138 and 6, if you don't have anything, please? Mm -hmm. Though a higher be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. It's interesting that there's a precept somewhere in Sirach that talks about every creature cleaveth to his kind or mm -hmm. to his like. In uh, Isaiah 57, about verse 15 to 17, the Holy Spirit says she dwells with him that's of a humble and contrite spirit. Allah Hayim, that's who he is. So he has respect unto the lowly because that's his kind, that's his type. He clicks with that person. But the proud is contrary to him so he keeps the distance for understanding our father and understanding who we need to be to be near unto him the commandments in humility that ahaya gave to keep us near unto him and away from idols is the doctrine of life can you read Sirach 19 and 19 please the knowledge of the commandments of the lord is the doctrine of life Knowing them alone doesn't grant us life, though. Because life is for those who actually keep the commandments in humility and long-suffering. Can you read Hermas Parable 8, chapter 7, verse 6, please? Life is for all those that keep the commandments of the Lord. But in the commandment, there's nothing about first places or about glory of any kind, but about long-suffering and humility in man. And such men, therefore, is the life of the Lord. But in factious and lawless men is death. 
Pride will not suffer a man to keep the commandments, but instead will be focused on being the first or better than others and glorying in themselves, not being able to submit to a higher power, but walking according to their own understanding. And that will make Ahaya put a person afar off from him, since it's an idol in our thoughts to walk in that doctrine. Sirach 10 and 12, please. The beginning of pride is when one departeth from Elohim, and his heart is turned away from his maker. When pride enters your heart, it takes you away from the life of Elohim, because pride is not subject to the law, nor can be humbled to follow instructions. The spirit of fornication teaches arrogance, so she gets us in pride to turn away from our maker in spiritual fornication, departing from his law in our mind and our heart. Can you read next verse, please? Well, pride is the beginning of sin. So spiritual fornication is the beginning of evil, to listen to idols. Then the pride comes in to begin sinning according to the idols of the heart. All right. And he that hath it shall pour out abomination. That's the result of idolatry in heart, as the idols' abominations is what we will bring forth through them assisting us. All right. And therefore the Lord brought upon them strange calamities and overthrew them utterly. A lot of odd events and afflictions happen because of idolatry. And when we don't catch ourselves to stop and look in the mirror as to why it's happening, we can get left in it to our destruction, thinking it's normal for such calamities to befall a person. Interesting that the world is in a lot of calamities because the world is in pride. So we'll think this is just what it is. This is how life is, not realizing, no, it's the pride that's affecting us all. So it seems normal, but it's truly not in the light of Allah Hayyam, if we were walking in his law. So when in pride, you can't keep the commandments. So it gives the place for fornication to be factious and lawless unto our hurt, as the angel told Hermas. Knowing all this, this is true wisdom to fear Allah Hayyam in humility keeping his law in long suffering to have life with him. Can you read Surat 19 and 20, please? The fear of the Lord is all wisdom, and in all wisdom is the performance of the law and the knowledge of its omnipotency. The knowledge of the doctrine of life and the commandments is necessary. And all wisdom of the knowledge of the commandments and Allah Hayyan's omnipotence is shown by our fear of him and performance of his laws. When we have that knowledge, walking in all wisdom, fearing him and performing his law, we will do things that please him and receive the fruit of the tree of immortality. Can you jump to verse 19, please? And they that do things that please him shall receive the fruit of the tree of immortality. By precept, the things that please him are doing his commandments, so that we may be blessed to have right to the tree of life in the city of New Jerusalem. Revelations 22 and 14, please. Bless the day that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So doing things that please him in his commandments gives right to the tree of life and receiving of the fruit of immortality upon it. On the other hand, being led by the spirit of fornication and pride into idolatry and committing sin against the law of Allah Hayyam will not get access into the city of New Jerusalem. Can you read verse 15, please? Or well, without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh the lie. Understand that being without the city leads us to partake in the lake of fire because of our works. Can you read Revelations 21 and 8, please? 
But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the light which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Seeing the evil of spiritual fornication following the customs and doctrines of the idols to sin against Allah Hayyam doesn't grant us access to the city or right to the tree of life, nor receiving of immortality, but rather the lake of fire for our reward with the spirits that led us. Ahaya is truly to be praised and feared above all deities, since his ways and doctrine will give us life, peace, and immortality. Can you read Psalms 96 and 4, please? Well, Ahaya is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all Elohims. For all the Elohims of the nations are idols, but Ahaya made the heavens. Hopefully that helps for understanding idolatry is spiritual fornication, and the end result of sinning in the spirit of fornication under other deities and their religions besides Ahaya, Elohim and his religion will not be for our good. There will come a time when the Gentiles and anyone who follows the religions of the spirits that lead astray will come to realize that their fathers inherited lies and will turn unto the true Allah Hayyam and his religion, eventually trusting in him. Can you read Jeremiah 16 and 19, please? Oh, Ahaya, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say surely our fathers have inherited lies vanity and things wherein there is no profit when anyone of any nation comes to realize the religions of the world are lies wherein is no profit because it's not bringing us unto obedience to the commandments of ahaya yache and the holy spirit where we have life through humility to obey them through long suffering in love towards all they will also come out of the ways of the world, knowing the vanity of any religion of idolatrous origin in unbelief. Jeremiah 10, verse 2 and 3, please. Thus saith Ahiah, learn not the ways of the heathen, for the customs of the people are vain. If we search the scriptures by precepts according to the law and testimonies and find heathen practices or customs or any lies in the religion, it's either we need to conform to the truth identified in scriptures to get to true religion or discontinue that religion that is making or loving lies, lest we be found in transgression ourselves and partake in the fire for those who love or make lies or are liars all of which fall under the children of the devil, the father of lies. Anyone seeking to serve the true Allah to be his vessel where his spirit dwells, can't also be in agreement with idolatrous lifestyles of the customs of the house of idols, as he is the holy Allah that is not in agreement with the devil and the idols. Can you read 2 Corinthians 6? Verse 16, 18, and then chapter 7, verse 1, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of Elohim with idols? For ye are the temple of the living Elohim, as Elohim hath said, I would dwell in them, and walk in them. And I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Second Corinthians chapter seven verse one. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. Believers in Elohim must focus on cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit to perfect holiness in the fear of Elohim through keeping his laws and walking in his mannerisms in the fruits of the spirit as the temple of the living Elohim. That ties back to 
what spirit is in us is what's going to be exemplified. So we need to be working on walking in it so that we'll actually exemplify the spirit of Allah because it's actually in us. All right. Second Corinthians six, verse 17, please. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. The unclean thing is idolatry. Can you read Colossians 3 and 5, please? Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So Allah wants us not to touch that unclean thing by mortifying our members upon the earth, destroying that old man through good works, prayers, and thanksgiving taking everything as good from Allah Hayyam, so that he would eventually be in all our thoughts and no idol would have place in us, okay? And in all our works. You got anything, Zakwa? No, I'm good. Um, just to touch on it briefly, uh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, Evil concupiscence and covetousness are all idolatry. They all stem from hearkening to an idol. Just so you can um, understand. Inordinate affection is um, same kind relations. Uh, it's inordinate. Um, evil concupiscence. You know what that is, Casa? Let me make sure people know it before we go. We're on fornication, so we're going to explain that. So you can definitely understand that. Concupiscence is desire, craving, longing, desire for what is forbidden, lust. And of course, oh, evil lust. is, yeah, evil is evil. So, injurious, right. worthless, bad, evil, harm, ill, wicked. So. Right, because it's an evil lust. Because you can, there is a good lust, which is actually zeal or being zealous for righteousness. So, I got it. Thank you. If you notice, Paul was saying keep from all evil. Once we're out of idolatry, it can keep us from all evil because idolatry is the cause of all evil. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, I'm good. I'm ready to go. All right. That was understanding the spirits of world religions and our necessity to come out of it all so that we can be joined on Talahayim. Now we're going to touch back on the power of names because that demon, as Modi has said, we didn't understand that they weren't truly deities and that they're angels over them. So there's power in names to frustrate them. Let's touch back on the power of names to help deliver from idols and idolatry before continuing, and to help us know the true religion as names matter in regards to which deity we are under. All right. Testament Solomon 21, please. And I at once bade another demon to be led unto me. And instantly there approached me, the demon Athmodeus, bound and I asked him, Who art thou? Remember, he said that men that we all, we don't understand the angels that are over them, but we believe they're actually deities. Okay. And short will be thy tyranny over us. And then we shall again have free range over mankind. So as that they shall revere us as if it were Elohim's, not knowing men as they are, the name for the angels set over us. All right. Understand the power of names actually matter by evidence of the angels' names over these demons frustrating them. Now that the Son of the Most High has revealed himself, we don't need all the names of all the angels, thankfully. As we've seen in the New Testament, demons were rebuked by the name of the Son. The scriptures help confirm 
having the name of the son is the name we need in that he has authority over the prince of all demons so they can all be frustrated by him as he did in the gospels especially now since he has power in heaven and earth by his sacrifice when you look at matthew chapter 28 let's confirm the name of yache and its power real quick testament of solomon chapter 52 please and I said to him, I adjure thee in the name of the Alahayim, Sobot. That's of host. That's an English rendition of Sobawata in the Hebrew. It means host. Okay. But tell me by what name thou art frustrated along with thy host. And the spirit answered me, the great among men, who is to suffer many things at the hands of men whose name is the figure 644, which is Emmanuel. He it is who hath bound us, and who will then come and plunge us from the steep underwater. He is noised abroad in the three letters which bring him down. Let's understand what this demon is talking about. This demon is speaking before Christ, who is known as Emmanuel. But Emmanuel isn't the three-letter name that actually invokes him to bring him down. When you go look in the Hebrew and look at the spelling in Hebrew, of the letters for Emmanuel is more than three letters. So you can know the three-letter name. That's a different name that actually invokes and brings him. The three-letter name in Hebrew is Yache. When you look at H3467, you can see the spelling. But the pronunciation in Hebrew is Yache. That brings down the son of Alahayim to bind demons. Now, let's confirm the name Yache can deliver from all demons, since he has authority over the prince of all demons. So we don't need to know the name of all the angels that frustrate each demon today. Can you read chapter 12, please? And gave him the seal, saying, Away with thee, and bring me hither the prince of all the demons. Okay, let's see who this is. So Arnias took the finger ring and went off to Beelzebul, who has kingship over the demons. So Beelzebul, which is also Beelzebub in the gospel, has kingship over demons, as he is their prince. All right, continue chapter 15, please. And I answered him and said, Who art thou? The demon replied, I am Beelzebub, the exarch of the demons. And all the demons have their chief seats close to me. And I, it is, who make manifest the apparition of each demon. And he promised to bring to me in bonds all the unclean spirits. And I summoned again to stand before me Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. And I set him down on a raised seat of honor and said to him, why art thou alone, prince of the demons? And he said to me, Because I alone am left of the angels of heaven that came down. For I was first angel in the first heaven, being entitled Beelzebul, and now I control all those who are bound in Tartarus. This angel Beelzebul, or Beelzebub, he has authority over all demons and can bind all unclean spirits and has control over all those bound in Tartarus. So if we have the name of the angel who frustrates him, we have the powerful name that we need. Okay. Chapter 29, please. And I said to him, tell me by what angel thou art frustrated. And he answered, by the holy and precious name of the almighty Allah, called by the Greeks by a row of numbers, of which the sum is 644. And among the Hebrews it is Emmanuel. And if one of the Romans adjured me by the great name of the power, elite, I disappear at once. All right. We see... He's speaking of Emmanuel, which is Christ. The holy and precious name of the Almighty Allah, 
is Yache, the three-letter Hebrew word that invokes him. He said the Almighty Allah, right? So we can understand that Yache, Christ, is the Almighty Allah. The Almighty Allah, who spake with Abraham in Genesis 17 and 1, he is the same angel that helped Jacob in Genesis 48, verse 15 and 16. And this angel is Christ Yache, who Abraham knew of and rejoiced to see his day, as Christ himself said in John 8 and 56 to help understand that precious and holy name of the Almighty Allah, who is Emmanuel, is actually Yache the Christ. Because it was that angel that was there helping. Even you have Joshua. When that angel came down to fight, when it was time to conquer the land, Joshua had to take off his shoes because that was holy ground because he was standing before Yache. That angel is the same angel that Moses saw in the burning bush. And you know it's Yache because Moses also had to take off his shoes because where he stood, it was holy ground to know who the almighty Allah is and to know that three-letter name that invokes him and brings him down. Anything else that would need to be explained there, Zachar? Can you give the letters for the people that don't understand Hebrew or are not aware? Sure. H 3467. If you look at Psalms 132, 16, it could be H 3467 or 3468. They're both the same Hebrew spelling. The word is three letters. It's a thing that looks like a little it looks like an apostrophe. That's actually a Y letter. Okay. And there's another one that it almost looks like a W. It's uh it represents the SH sound or the CH sound. And then there's a third letter that looks like the letter Y, but it actually represents the vowel sound of E, I, A, O, or U. The Hebrew letters, the Y is Yota. The SH looking thing that looks like a W, that's a, how do you say that again? This word is actually hard to pronounce. Give me a moment. <laughs> I got to get my, my mouth right for it with this Hebrew. It's Chinyi. You can find it in Yoruba. With Inyi, it still means like something hard and white like a tooth. And actually, ivory and tooth are still definitions of the word any, which is retained from the ancient Hebrew meaning when you look in the concordance, that it actually meant ivory and tooth to know that the pronunciation is actually accurate. And the word is cheni. The che comes from the Igbo, where the word che is used in words like oche, which means to laugh, smile, or grin, showing the teeth, if you will. So cheni for the second letter and then the last letter is e which is for the, the i it looks like a y but it represents an i or a vowel sound so now pronunciation of that word is ya che che is the root word of that whole word let him save you ebos will understand that ya che ya che bayani. let him save us to know that three letter word and it also confirms through what that demon said that no other name that's not a three-letter word referring and explaining Yache, which is salvation, bringing salvation, having salvation, when you look at all the definitions pertaining to his name, no other word could be his name. Because that word Yache, it means to be open, wide, or free. That is by implication to be safe causatively to free or succor he frees from iniquity succors from whatever we may be facing to keep us he avenges delivers defend help preserve 
rescue, be safe, bring salvation, have in salvation, save, savior, and get victory. Because he actually is his spirit in us that leads to getting the victory. And we have website tabs, a few of them, and lessons on the name to help for confirmation. Anything else you think is needed? I think that's good. Okay. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. Also, remember the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is necessary for deliverance from the devil himself, according to the hymn of the pearl that tells of the process we go through to come out of the world. I'm going to touch on that real quick. Acts of Thomas 105, please. We're going into the hymn of the pearl. It's a song, but it's a song with parabolic meaning of understanding the journey we go through in this life to go through the process of overcoming the devil. When you're ready, please, Aqua. When I was a baby, too young to talk in the palace of my father and resting in the wealth and luxury of my caretakers. The palace is in the heavens, and the caretakers are the angels who care over the souls before they enter into the world, into fleshly bodies. All right. Out of the east, our native country, my parents equipped me and set me on a mission. The east is the heavens. This is speaking of a soul going out of heaven to enter the world, to dwell in a physical body of flesh. When a soul is created, they are in the care of the angels in the far east, in the heavens, and each soul gets sent into the world on a mission from the parents, which are the Holy Father and the mother of all creation. All right, continue, please. So they made a covenant with me and inscribed it on my mind so that I should not forget it and said, when you go down into Egypt, Egypt is the world, right? And bring back from there the one pearl which is there in the midst of the sea, strapped about the devouring serpent. That's the devil himself. The pearl is a sign of overcoming him, right? You shall put on your garment set with gems. That's Christ's spirit, right? And that robe on which it all rests. That's the Holy Spirit. And meet your brother that is next to us, and who is well remembered as an heir in our kingdom. That's Christ, the brother. The mission to overcome the devil, the serpent, and the pearl is a sign of overcoming him. In order to do so, we have to overcome our lusts, to be clothed with the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. The reward when a soul returns to heaven with the victory is the garment of immortality and the robe of the Holy Spirit and meeting Christ in the second kingdom. You can refer back to that lesson for a more detailed explanation. I don't forget what lesson it was. We talked about that now. Yeah. It was in one of them parenting lessons. So visit the family series to eventually find that portion. When a soul goes into the world to overcome the devils, the charm that works against the serpent are the names of the three that bear witness in heaven. Can you read that chapter 108, please? I soon started and began with charms against the terrible serpent. And I overcame the serpent by calling the name of my father, Haya, upon him in the name of our second in rank, Yache, and of my mother, the queen of the east, Ruaka Kodoshi. I then took the pearl and turned back to bear it to my fathers. So you see what a soul needs in order to take the pearl from the devil. All three names, the father, Ahaya, Ashire, Ahaya, the son, Yache, and the mother, Ruaka Kodoshi, the Holy Spirit. So only the names of Ahaya the Father and Lord of all, Yache Christ the Lord, our Lord, and 
Ruach HaKadoshi, the Holy Spirit and Mother of all creation, have the power to bring us out of our lust to overcome the devil and get the pearl and fulfill our mission to show ourselves the children of the Alahayim. Hopefully that helps for knowing the importance of those three names and the power they have over the devil and every angel and every spirit under him. In regards to Alahayim, terms like Lord in English or Rabbeinu in Arabic or Ab in Arabic, Abba, Hebrew, Father, English, the Most High in English, uh, in Hebrew, that's Elu Ya'ono, uh, Yah, that's Hebrew, or the English Jah, the Hebrew word Alahayim, or in Arabic, Ile or Ileha, for plural, are all fine to use. Notice we're specific about what we're talking about. Those words are fine to use. Other words, we're not saying that. Those words are fine to use. Yet, the power for deliverance from the devil is in the Hebrew name, Ahaya, Ashre Ahaya. Likewise, for Christ, one can use Lord, Christ, Messiah, Emmanuel. In Hebrew, is Ime no Ale or Ime no Allah. Everlasting Father, yet power to invoke him and bring him down is in the three letter name Yache that brings salvation to us. As there is only one name under heaven wherein we may be saved, according to Acts 4 and 12 and Philippians 2 and 9 or 2 and 10 tells he was given a name above every name. So no other person in scripture could have had the same name to know that that three letter name that only he has is that name wherein we may be saved. Any alleged name that isn't three Hebrew letters and is the name of other Israelites or other people in Scripture cannot be the name of Christ to save us. Refer to the website tabs and the lessons for further edification on the names and importance of the names as well. Hopefully for now, until we do more teaching on the names, if Allah wills, you can see the right names are important as they frustrate demons evil angels, and overcome the devil himself. As Zachwell mentioned in some prior lesson, that we need the name of Yache to overcome, or to better yet say, come out of our iniquity as well. Anything else there, Zachwell? No, I'm good already. All right. All right. Now, transition in here. Let's get understanding of is sinning spiritual fornication? Speaking of iniquity and continuing building on understanding spiritual fornication, let's look into whether sinning in itself is actually spiritual fornication. Can you read Jubilees 11 and 4, that portion, please? A malignant spirit assisted and seduced them into committing transgression and uncleanness. Remember Jubilees 11 and 4 said evil spirits seduced and assisted to commit transgression and uncleanness too. So it's also spiritual fornication when we commit other transgressions too, not just idolatry or literally making idols or partaking in the idolatrous religions of the world or calling up idols not to be named. Remember, committing sin is transgression of the law in 1 John 3 and 4. Can you read that verse real quick, please? Whoso committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So when we sin in transgressing the law to do evil, it's a work of idols in spiritual fornication as an evil spirit or angel seduced and assisted us to do so. Is not Allah Hayyam and His spirits leading us to do evil, but rather our desires that the evil spirits can see in us that they play on to get us to indulge in the pleasures of sin. 
can you read Sirach 15 and 20, please? He hath commanded no man to do wickedly, neither hath he given any man license to sin. Say not thou, he hath caused me to error, for he hath no need of the sinful man. All right, now Sirach 15 and 12 to go with that. Oh, my bad. It's all good. I like it, actually. If I could just <laughs> let it just read. <laughs> uh, ja no, read James 1 and 13 and 14, please. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of Elohim. For Elohim cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So we are tempted and withdrawn from the law by our desires. We have to grow in the fear of Allah Hayyam, not to love the abominable works of sin like him. Can you read Sirach 15 and 13, please? The Lord hateth all abomination, and they that fear Allah Hayyam love it not. So we see who Allah Hayyam is. Hopefully in the midst of all this, you get an understanding of Allah Hayyam too. He's lowly, meek, of a contrite spirit. And he cleaves to those who are also lowly and has respect unto them. And the things that please him are when we actually show fear of him and perform his commandments or his law. And we also see he doesn't love abomination. And if we love, have love for him, we also don't love it either. That's how he is. Let's see how his family is. His Holy Spirit doesn't help us sin either, so we can understand she wouldn't lead us to do wrong either. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon 1 and 4 and 5, please? For into a malicious soul wisdom shall not enter, nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit and remove from thoughts that are without understanding and will not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. So we see the mother's perspective. When Allah is not in all the thoughts, she departs. She does not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. So she does not aid in any wrongdoing. And she separates herself from thoughts that are without understanding in the law to keep from evil. All right. Now let's understand their son, Christ. The son is separate from sinners. So his spirit doesn't lead to sin either, as he has no concord with Belia. Can you read Hebrews 7 and 26, please? For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. All right, 2 Corinthians 6 and 15. And what concord have Christ with Belial? Hopefully you can see he can't have concord with Belial because he's separate from sinners and he's harmless, holy, and undefiled with any idols or any unclean thing. Second Timothy 2 and 19, please. Nevertheless, the foundation of Allah standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So you see, it can't be Allah leading us to do wrong, as those that fear him don't love any abomination. And Christ, his son's name, leads us to depart from iniquity. All right? And the Holy Spirit isn't in the thoughts of iniquity. So, who's leading to all this error in us? and in the world. It's the devil, the ruler of these evil spirits, leading them to do these things against us so we can go astray. Can you read Jubilees 11 and 5, please? The prince Mastema exerted himself to do all this, and he sent forth other spirits, those which were put under his hand, to do all manner of wrong and sin, and all manner of transgression, to corrupt and destroy, and to shed blood upon the earth. So the father of lying, the devil, is at work in all this, sending spirits under his control to cause transgression and sin in spiritual fornication, listening to the wrong spirits, 
in our thoughts and being assisted by them to do wrong. Who else has partaken in his work? Testament of Simeon 5 and 3, please. Beware, therefore, of fornication. For fornication is the mother of all evils, separating from Elohim and bringing near to Belier. The mother of all evils is at work to draw us away from Elohim and bring us near to the devil so we can be under him and his spirits that he sends to assist us in doing evil. You can kind of see the relationship dynamic between the devil and fornication is that she draws whoever she can influence herself unto Belier, and he uses whomever he has under his power to cause transgression and committing sin. If you don't have anything, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. And then I would like you to just read all of this as it is without the verses because it flows so well. But That's all good. I, I'll work it out for you. Appreciate it. <laughs> First John chapter 3, verse 10. And this the children of Elohim are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of Elohim, neither he that loveth not his brother. 1 John 3 and 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 1 John 3 and 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. 1 John 3 and 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Elohim was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3 and 11 For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Romans 13 and 10 Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13 and 9 For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Romans 13 and 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. The separation for us is clear. To become the children of Allah through love, fulfilling his law, or be the children of the enemy through sinning. Allah is beholding our deeds to reward us according to our works. Can we read Gad the Seer chapter 14 verse 5 to see what happens in the spirit world when Allah is assessing what's going on amongst the children of men? Please. Gad the Seer chapter 14 verse 5. And the appearance of the glory of Ahiah was like the appearance of the rainbow, his covenant. And the host of heaven were standing before him on his right hand and on his left hand. And Satan was standing by them, but behind them. And lo, a man dressed in linen brought before the glory of Ahiah three books that were written about every man. And he read in the first one, and it was found to have the just deeds of his people. And Ahiah said, These will live forever. And Satan said, Who are these guilty people? And the man dressed in linen cried to Satan like a ram's horn, saying, Keep silent, for this day is holy to our master. And he read in the second book, and it was found to have the inadvertent sins of his people. And Ahiah said, Put aside this book, but save it until one-third of the month elapses to see what they would do. And he read in the third book, and it was found to have malicious deeds of his people. And Ahiah said to Satan, These are thy share. Take them and do with them as it seemeth good to thee. And Satan took those who acted maliciously, and he went with them to a wasteland to destroy them there. 
see what the devil plans are for us as destroying us is good to him. We have a time under grace to learn our inadvertent sins and overcome them before the appointed time Allah has ordained for each man. For us, when we serve any spirit to do evil against Allah this falls under worshiping idols, and it's the cause of all evil in the world because idolatry is the beginning of spiritual fornication, which is the cause of committing evil and results in evil. Wisdom of Solomon 14 and 27, please. For the worshipping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. Right. And also remember, for when Allah was looking at the deeds of the children of Israel, the ones that did justly, he said these will live forever. Just like Ezekiel chapter 18 talks about, if we turn from our wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, we shall surely live, we shall not die. So we can have that for assurance and not doubt that if we get it right, we'll be fine, no matter what we had done. <sighs> right. So all evil comes from spiritual fornication, worship, and idols through scripture. Once the spirit of fornication has place in our thoughts, it will cause us a sin similar to when the angel of iniquity enters our heart and we give heed to him, we will commit sin as well. We have to be in tune with our mind, our heart, and senses in this spiritual warfare. We have discussed the angel of wickedness in the lesson, Attacks of the Mind and Overcoming by Faith, for reference. Today, understanding that spirit of fornication itself is important to look into. But before looking into the spirit of fornication, let's touch on the family environment of the household of the devil and his side, if you will, which will help us understand the worldly family environment a bit and things to be mindful of ourselves to come out of the world a bit too, a bit more, to eventually be out of it completely. Sorry. The dynamics of the demon's family. These evil angels, the parents of these evil spirits, actually help the demons to get us to do wrong. You can already see it in how fornication withdraws whomever she can from Allah to bring us unto Belier. And then Belier sends spirits to cause the transgressions, which brings about all the evil in the world to make us his children. But let's see evidence through precepts of how the evil angels operate with their children, looking at Beelzebul, that prince of the demons. Can you touch in Testament of Solomon chapter 26, please? And I summoned again to stand before me Beelzebul, the prince of the demons. And I set him down on a raised seat of honor and said to him, Why art thou alone, prince of the demons? And he said to me, Beelzebul has said a few things to Solomon. We're going to jump to the part that we're looking for right now because we want to learn about the demonic family environment. Can you continue reading, please? But I too have a child, and he hunts the Red Sea. So angels can have children too, as we've seen before, and after the flood, according to Genesis 6 and 4. Continue, please. And on any suitable occasion, he comes up to me again, being subject to me, and reveals to me what he has done, and I support him. Now, the righteous angels, on the other hand, don't support their evil children, as Uriel didn't support Onias, his son, in his evil. Yet we see this behavior of supporting family members in their evil, being their enablers out of love for them, is a characteristic of evil angels by what Beelzebub is doing. Their children, the demons, also confirm they get supported in their evil doings by their father's will as well. Can you read Acts of Thomas chapter 75, please? We're jumping into portions of this chapter, okay? And the devil said, This is a devil, not the devil himself. So it's an evil spirit. All right, continue, please. Like your Christ that helps you in whatever you do, so it's my Father that helps me in whatever I do. 
confirming that evil angels help their children in what they're doing, like Beelzebul said. Continue, please. And like you that are refreshed by your prayers, good works, and your spiritual thanksgivings, so am I also refreshed by doing murders, adulteries, and doing sacrifices made with wine upon altars. The evil children regain strength of energy from the evils that are done in spiritual fornication. So you can see how continuing in our sins benefits them and strengthens them, but doesn't help rid of them. While on the other hand, prayers, good works in the law and thanksgiving, no matter what happens, taking everything as good from Allah Hayim, does strengthen us in Christ, our everlasting father, and weakens the demons effect upon us to eventually where they have no place in us or power over us. All right. Understand demons have different businesses or pleasures that they do in men. This demon, for example, he likes murders, adulteries, and sacrifices made with wine upon altars. Other demons like the one that one lady demon, she likes changing of kind. That's her thing. And we're going to see some other demons that have different pleasures. So understand every evil, there's a spirit that actually has pleasure in it that helps assist and seduce us to do it so that they can fulfill their desire and have their pleasure. Um, anything else on that, Zappa? I'm just going to touch on uh, spiritual thanksgivings. Sure. Um, um, it's part of the things that refreshes us. So being thankful for everything actually brings forth humility. Like if I'm thankful for waking up in the morning, I'm thankful for having a shower to bathe in. I'm thankful for having clothes to put on and shoes to put on my feet. I'm thankful. The more things I'm thankful for, the more things I'm not looking at that I'm lacking or that I, or that I'm covening. So the more things I'm thankful for, it actually starts removing the works of the flesh in certain aspects as far as coveting, jealousy, envy, in those those regards because you're actually thankful to Allah for the things that you have and you're focused on those things. So it actually refreshes you. Whereas on the other hand, not being thankful and not thinking upon the things that Allah is doing for you will lead you to covet, will lead you to have jealousy, will lead you to envy. So you can actually see how that works. Oh, sure. Thank you. It's All right. Let's continue when you're ready, please. And in the same way, he uses you to prepare vessels worthy of inhabiting. So also does he seek out vessels whereby I may accomplish his deeds. The fathers of the evil spirits seek out people that would be good for the evil spirits to accomplish their deeds in them that they desire when they dwell in them. While Yache uses those that are doing well by him to nourish and prepare others to be worthy of his spirit to dwell in them and do well too. So you can see that dichotomy. Apocalypse of Paul tells how when we die, Zachary like talked about it before, the evil spirits, they actually come right up to make sure to see if they have place in us. Even in our life, they can see, just as Allah sees, the demon sees what spirit is in us, what desires we have. And they look to see if we're good, if we're fit for what they want to accomplish. Okay. In continuing, let's see what this demon said, please. In the same way, he nourishes and provides for his subjects. So, Yache has true love for his children that subject themselves to him, nourishing and providing for them. Right? Touching back to that thankfulness, always being thankful for everything, knowing it's something being provided by him. Continue, please. So also does he prepare chastisements or punishments and torments for them that become my dwelling place. The evil angels, on the other hand, having one subject to them through their children, they are abusive, preparing afflictions in our life. 
they treat their children in the flesh the same way as they treat the evil spirits with the same abuse too. Continue, please. Do you mean they, they treat their children with the same way they're being abused from the evil spirits? What do I need to say to make it sound and be understandable? Proper. The You're talking about the parents, right? You're right. The uh, angels, yeah. The angels. Okay, the, the angels, they... Right, okay. You, you're trying to say it the way I was trying to say it. Um, the, the evil angels, they... It says they also prepare chastisements and torments for them that become my dwelling place. So the evil angels are going to start treating whoever the evil spirit is inhabiting the same way that they treat the evil spirit. So they're creating that vessel for them or that dwelling place for their actual spiritual child. And they start treating you of the flesh the same way they treat their spiritual child so you start getting abused too and mm -hmm. by being abused you start reciprocating the abuse to others that you come in contact with the toxic environment And you can see on the right hand side, Allah Haim sees his son's spirit in you. He'll start treating you like he treats his son. All right. And his other spirits, his other children. Okay. Continue, please. And in the same way, he rewards you for your works by giving you eternal life. So in the same way, he rewards my works by giving me eternal destruction. The demons, being evil themselves, being raised in an abusive environment, and also causing whomever they're dwelling in to operate in an abusive environment, they continue to cycle. And these demons, they're only nurtured to destroy by perverting us to obey them to eternal destruction and torment in the judgment to come. Continue, please like you that have come to preach good news so have i also come but to destroy when they operate in us that's what they do destroy relationships try to cause others to fall from the faith of yache christ and cause stumbling blocks for folks by manipulation to convert you to receive eternal destruction or pervert you to receive eternal destruction continue please and like you, as you convert men to eternal life, so do I also pervert men that obey me to eternal destruction and torment. So you receive your own, and I receive mine. This is what they do, and anyone they operate in would do the same, to pervert folks from the faith to obey them to their hurt, just like the unbelieving Pharisees who were children of the devil, Having these spirits operating in them led people away from the faith to obey them in their traditions and customs, putting aside the commands of Allah Hayyim to their destruction. I want to touch on what we just talked about real quick. I want to bring it to fruition. Okay. Uh, please. Don't mind. Please. It says, And like you, as you convert men to eternal life, so do I also pervert men that obey me to eternal destruction and torment. Uh, as you look in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, it says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, right? Wholesome means health, healing, cure. Properly curative, that is literally, concretely, a medicine, or abstractly, a cure. Figuratively, concretely, deliverance, right? So it would be cure, healing, or health, 
remedy sound wholesome yielding right it's yielding fruit right so technically deliverance or a cure a wholesome tongue right which is someone that's using their tongue to edify or to help right not to lift themselves up not to um, boast themselves not to exalt themselves with their knowledge or whatever case is but always looking to help or to edify to actually cure somebody or to bring somebody to get health right it says um and like as you convert men to eternal life so a wholesome tongue is the tree of life so a wholesome tongue would actually convert men to eternal life which would give them of the tree of life which is immortality but it says so do i also pervert men right now on the other end it says but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit now perverseness is crookedness perverseness or crooked dealings or distortion that is um viciousness right now when we go look at the definition so we can actually get more understanding um of distortion right one of the words with distortion the word distortion means the action of giving a misleading account or impression right so the action of giving a misleading account or impression right so you're not honest or you're leaving things out to omit things purposely right it says but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit now as we see right here it says so do i also pervert men that obey me to eternal destruction and torment so now we're getting further understanding of what he's actually talking about and how he actually perverts men because you have to obey him it's you that actually allow the spirit to be breached that's why it says therein is a is a breach in the spirit you actually allow your spirit to be breached by obeying the evil spirit because it's actually you that actually fulfills what the evil spirit is trying to accomplish because it says but perverseness right perverseness is the action of giving a misleading account or impression so it's by you hiding your faults or you lying and giving a, a, a an account that's not actually truthful or completely truthful it actually opens the door for your spirit to be breached by this evil spirit to perverse you to actually lead you astray from Alahayim to destruction and torment so this is why we have to guard ourselves that we are actually doing what's right in the sight of Alahayim and that we're actually speaking truth to our neighbor and to ourselves so that we would not have our spirit breached by an evil spirit to come in to actually lead us astray from what is good that's going to lead us to eternal life because a wholesome tongue is not going to speak lies and it's going to be honest and it's going to tell the whole story and not just parts of the story that make themselves look good or parts of the story that make them look like they don't have any they didn't have any um, part of what was going on they're not going to give off the impression that they are blameless because they're going to be honest that honesty is actually what helps convert us the honesty with ourselves and others is what actually helps convert us because then we're honest with Allah and when we make a mistake we're honest we're able to fix it because we're honest but if we're constantly trying to cover our faults and not telling the truth 
we're going to be perverted. And it's actually our works by listening to the evil spirit that actually causes us to go off in, into eternal destruction and torments. So, there's our hands with that. Great understanding. Hey man, I see you over there working, Casa. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to stick these things in here. In another teaching, Lord, we we get into discussing more on the devil and his family and these spirits to watch out for. Mentioning it because you mentioned the lion. You know, lion is the son of the devil, so his his children come back up every time as they play a major part in keeping us away from the hope of the calling. That's what perversion is. Perversion is lying. See. And you see distortion is the action of giving a misleading account or impression. So you're literally um, you're literally speaking to give a misleading account or you're acting like you didn't have anything to do with it yeah. to give that off that impression. So it's, you know, in the catching a lie lesson, you got to see that it wasn't just only speaking a lie. You can actually, um, you can actually <laughs> do of actions that are lies. So. Yeah. Guile. All right. Acting, feigning. Um, that perverseness to remember per evil perverseness, that's a um product of fornication. Spirit of fornication. So it goes with all the stuff we're talking about. Because the evil perverseness takes us away from the commandments. Right. That was important to get. Um getting back to this arrogance, understanding how the environment it just breeds arrogance, being surrounded by it, and the evil spirits operate in that same arrogance that fornication teaches. What we see in these demons are results of the spiritual fornication as some demons had come from the fornication committed between angels and the daughters of men. That trait of children of fornication being in an enabling environment to do evil and supported in doing it breeds arrogance, whether in this world or in the spiritual world, even as the arrogance of these evil spirits can be seen in how they think and operate being raised up in the toxic environment Therefore, through their arrogance, they can't be subject to the law and pour out abominations. This will be the case for us as well if we allow such spirits to lead us in this world, being led by our lust. We touch him back to Asmodeus in chapter 21 to see, now we touch back to see how he was talking, to see how any child of fornication, whether literally them demons that came through it and anybody in the world there's an arrogance there's a pride that comes with it even as pride is the beginning of when one departs from their maker when you're ready in testament of solomon chapter 21 please and i at once bade another demon to be led unto me and instantly there approached me the demon of modius bound and i asked him who art thou and he shot on me a glance of anger and rage and said who art thou? This is a demon, but you see his reaction is what we see in real life. He looked at him like, like, who are you talking to? You see the pride of his countenance and the response when spoken to instead of the gentle and meek nature of Christ's true children. This is to understand when our countenance changes and we answer roughly, in the wrong spirit is literally the wrong spirit working in us, causing us to sin, and we need to catch it and repent if we do fall in it, correct the behavior, confessing it, and not justifying the wrong by any means, and getting understanding and insight to overcome that hurdle in our life 
as its spiritual fornication hearkening to idols to let them work in us seeking to refresh themselves to dwell in us or have place to come and go as they please by converting our mindset to serve them and their needs. Continue, please. And I said to him, Thus punished as thou art, answer if thou me. But he with rage said to me, But how shall I answer thee? For thou art a son of man, whereas I was born an angel seed by a daughter of man, so that no word of our heavenly kind addressed to the earth born can be overweening. It's a few things in here. Notice he's being, he's already punished, but he hasn't let go of his pride. We talked a bit early in the lesson about how we go through afflictions. Demons are afflicting us. Allah is afflicting us, but we don't let go of our pride when in the wrong spirits. So that's another symptom of knowing when we're still in the struggle, that things are going bad, but we don't stop to actually let go of our pride and come out of it or look to see what's going on so we can come out of it. Now, touching on what he said, he said, but how shall I answer thee? For thou art a son of man, whereas I was born an angel seed by a daughter of man, so that no word of our heavenly kind addressed to the earthborn can be overweening. He is from the angel sleeping with a, a human woman. That's fornication. Okay, so we're literally looking at a child of fornication here. When he believes none word that he speaks can be overweening. Overweening means showing excessive confidence or pride. So he felt he was better than mankind in creation. So it's not possible he could say anything in pride. So his response was fine. Though it wasn't fine, but to him, it was actually fine because he felt he's greater than man in his high mindedness. He felt he could talk to us however he want. And this spirit affects in the world where people feel like they can talk to someone however they want. So from his parents supporting and enabling him, he's high minded and arrogant speaking and dealing condescendingly towards who he feels he's better than. Remember, this demon is a child of fornication spiritually from when the angels slept with the daughters of men. So his arrogance isn't something to be surprised at since the spirit of fornication herself teaches arrogance to who she can influence from what Judah said in chapter 17 of the Testament of Judah. So a characteristic of fornication at work in idolatry by the wrong spirit at work in us is high mindedness or arrogance to think we're better than others and or to talk to others in a rageful or arrogant manner as the devil shared the same arrogance towards Adam. All right. And we then see that fornication and arrogance will not allow us to have humility and long suffering, therefore treating others as beneath us in all our thoughts and justifying our wrongdoings. As literally just happened, Solomon says something to him and he justified what he did. What do you mean? There's no way I can speak to you pridefully. You're less than me. I'm a heavenly creature. You're not. This happens in real life, and it can even happen in a gospel where just because we might know some information that someone doesn't know, we treat them like they're less than us or we're better than them. Or we might not struggle with something that someone else struggles with. We'll deal with them like we're better than them, and it'll show in how we look at them, talk to them, or how we think about them. And that takes me to... Proverbs 15 and 2. It says, The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. So the tongue of the wise is using knowledge to help somebody or to edify someone. That's how they use the knowledge aright. Because they're using it for the good, for good things to help one another. But the mouth of fools Pour out foolishness. 
because the mouth of a fool, they're going to, they know a lot of knowledge. They're going to pour out knowledge, but it's not going to be to edify. It's not going to be to help. It's going to be for self exaltation. It's going to be for pride's sake. They're going to speak over your head because they really don't want you to understand it. It's just to exalt themselves. So you can see even in the case for Solomon, he he wasn't trying to be on one accord or to edify Solomon or to to help Solomon. It was to exalt himself over Solomon, which he was pouring out foolishness because that's not the way Elohim wants us to be and it's not humility. Pride wasn't made for man. So you can see how the evil spirit is actually struggling with pride, just as Brother Kosovo stated. Yeah. His knowledge puffed him up. Right. Thank you for that. Praise Allah. An example of the tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. And we know charity edifieth. So you see someone in a struggle, see someone, something going on. Think on love. What can you do in the knowledge that you have in love? What can you say with the knowledge that you have in love? Prayed Alahim about it before acting. It's a big thing of taking our time. Taking our time makes all the difference. Because the devil, through hatred, hatred and the devil uses hastiness of spirit to fulfill their works. So being in a rush gets us. And if you may take longer than some, just do well and communicate and be honest. Hey, I need a moment to think. Please. All right. Anything else, Zach, while we feel good? No, you're gonna you're gonna go back and deal with overweening, right? Please, um, if there's some you think will help us here, go ahead. The evil spirit said, but how shall I answer thee? For thou art a son of man. He's like, how can I answer you? For thou art a son of man. Whereas I was born an angel seed by a daughter of man, so that no word of our heavenly kind addressed to the earthborn can be overweening. Like he was literally talking over his head saying, there's nothing I can say to you because you're not going to understand it. So you can see the characteristics of the pride or the, the arrogance. It was like, I don't have to say anything to you and there's nothing I can say to you because you're not going to understand what I'm saying because I'm on this high level of understanding where charity edifies. So you can see that he would lack in charity. He's lacking these good spirits that would actually allow him to actually humble himself and edify and speak in a way that it can be understood. But that's not the characteristics of the evil spirit. So we actually get to see when we're lacking those characteristics, what's operating in us so that we can actually understand and examine ourselves. That is major because knowledge puffeth up. The devil, remember, he was full of wisdom too. Right. So if we see the more we're learning or anything we've learned, we start to get this sense of self, like feeling like we're doing something or with somebody just because we know something, 
That's not the knowledge of Allah. I am. It's not it. Don't make the mistake to think that doesn't happen in the faith. There's a whole group of people with that struggle. And it's going to take repentance. Kind of don't want to miss that. All right. Bill on seeing how knowledge can puff up as opposed to charity can edify and how that pride can keep us from growing or coming out of the struggle. We're going to touch Hermas parable nine to understand how even in the gospel we can fall to this pride and taking knowledge the wrong way to our to our hurt. Can you read Hermas parable nine chapter twenty two verse one to four, please? And from the fifth mountain, which had green grass and was rugged, they that believed are such as these. They are faithful but slow to learn and stubborn and self-pleasers, desiring to know all things, and yet they know nothing at all. By reason of this, their stubbornness, understanding stood aloof from them, and a foolish senselessness entered into them, and they praised themselves as having understanding, and they desired to be self-appointed teachers, senseless though they are. Owing then to this pride of heart, many, while they exalted themselves, have been made empty. For a mighty demon is stubbornness and vain confidence. Of these then, many were cast away, but some repented and believed and submitted themselves to those that had understanding, having learnt their own senselessness. Yea, and to the rest that belong to this class, repentance is offered. For they did not become wicked, but rather foolish and without understanding. If these then shall repent, they shall live unto Allah. But if they repent not, they shall have their abode with the women who work evil against them. So we touch here to see repentance is possible. And if you find that you have a lot of knowledge or you get knowledge, but it's not actually changing your interactions with others and your dealings so that you're actually walking in true understanding by departing from evil. Take some time to do some self-reflection and reason on what your intent is. Are you really desiring for the information to grow and change yourself or is it to exalt yourself? All right. Anything else there, Zachary? Oh, no, I'm good. All right. Now, as Zachary touched on, back on the way this demon operated, that demon, Asmodeus, he felt it was better than mankind in creation. He even had knowledge because demons can go up into the firmament and listen to what's going on in the heavens. So they'll, they actually think they're better than us because of the information they can get to. So between how he was made and the knowledge he had, he didn't think it was possible he could say anything in pride to a man who was less in creation than him. So his response was fine as he's greater than man in his high-mindedness. So from his parents supporting and enabling him, he's high-minded and arrogant, speaking and dealing condescendingly towards those he feels he's better than. He, being a child of fornication, we're seeing the works of fornication as she teaches arrogance in him. Also, it helps us know a characteristic of fornication at work in idolatry in the wrong spirit is being high-minded or arrogant, speaking to others in the wrong way, even as the devil did to Adam. We then see that fornication and arrogance also will not allow us to have humility and long-suffering, therefore treating others as beneath us in all our thoughts, and justifying our wrongdoings. When under the power of these evil angels and their children, the evil spirits, we exemplify the same works of pride as Psalm 10 and 4 showed in the pride of our countenance. We don't seek after Allah Hayyam, 
either like this demon didn't seek after Allah Hayyam, and his countenance showed it and his response and how he spoke showed it let's see also how we would be supporting evil within the household here in the earth when under these spirits can you read Asher Testament of Asher chapter 2 verse 3 please and there is a man that loveth him that worketh evil because he would prefer even to die in evil for his sake. And concerning this, it is clear that it hath two aspects, but the whole is an evil work. Though indeed he have love, yet is he wicked who concealeth what is evil for the sake of the good name. But the end of the action tendeth unto evil. This man, just like that evil angel, Love someone in his family. When I speak of the evil angel, talking about Beelzebul, how he loved his son and would support him. So this man, like that evil angel Beelzebul, he loves someone in his family, but is not according to Allah Hayim's love to hold the person accountable for their wrongdoing and not hide their sin in hopes they'll repent. But instead, according to the love of the world under the devil and his angels, one would love a person who does evil, supporting them in their evil, and or when they tell them the evil they've done, they won't correct or hold them accountable, but support them in it to the point that they would lay down their own life to stand for that person in evil. Also, they'll conceal their evil deeds for the sake of a good name with the evildoer, so they're man-pleasing in respect of persons preferring to die in evil with them, being their supporter, according to the loyalty and love of the world under Satan. This ties back to the keeping of secrets that is a trait in households or relationships that struggle with narcissistic spirits, as it helps keep people from repenting of evil when no accountability is there to do right and or hiding of iniquities so no one's wrongdoings are known or no one knows the wrongs that are going on in the relationship to make the person accountable to change for the sake of not wanting the wrongdoer to be upset with them. Or it can also be the wrongdoer also knows the wrongs that they're doing so they don't want to say anything uh, someone else will know what they're doing too. On the right hand under Allah Hayyam, a man under his power would truly love the evil person, but not be willing to do evil themselves out of love for that evildoer, or hide the evildoer's works out of respect for them when it could help them. An example of that is they'll love the evildoer by holding them accountable and correcting them when they tell of the evil they've done or they see the evil they're doing in hopes that the person would repent and do the evil no more because they're not willing to die in evil for the sake of the good name with the evil doer but rather they make sure they die to themselves in well doing unto Allah Hayyam by doing what's right unto him according to his precepts offering themselves up as a sacrifice in hopes let the Lord be moved to turn the heart of the person struggling with evil. I want to say something. Um, when dealing with situations like this, be mindful. Um, one, examine yourself to make sure that you're not the person that's struggling with this. And also, if you're dealing with someone that you may love and they're struggling, be mindful of their struggle. Because the way that fornication and arrogance or pride works when they come together, fornication and arrogance, fornication and pride. Remember, pride is the beginning of when one departed from Allah Hayyam. And fornication um, draws one to whatever they desire. And they have no... Um, no thought of Allah Hayyam. So you can see how both of those are working together where when you bring 
whatever it is that they have going on or whatever it is that they're doing, they um nine times out of ten, they're not going to see it because they don't want to see it. So they will either cleave to some manipulation tactic to pretty much back you up or they will deny, deny, deny because fornication has blinded them and pride made them depart from Elohim. So they're not, they're not, they're not going to hear the words of holiness. They're going to resent the words of holiness. So they're not going to hear your correction and they're going to look at your correction as an attack. So you can actually understand what's actually going on because they don't want to see it and they don't want to give give up what they desire, which is the fornication or whatever it is that they're, that they're going for. So you have to understand that, hey, though I may have to say something because I have to say something or else I'm partaking in your iniquity, I have to understand what comes with me saying something and I have to be prepared for that. And I even have to be prepared that you're not going to receive me. Because after I say what I say, I have to give it unto Allah Hayim. And I can't keep beating down the door for you to, to open up the door to be able to listen. I have to say it and let Allah Hayim work. And this is where we don't get into a passion. But instead, we leave unto Allah Hayim, the avenging. Or we leave unto Allah Hayim for the conversion. So be mindful of that, not to take things into your own hands, but to say what's needful if Allah Hayim leads you to say something and let it be. If you receive your brother or your sister, praise Allah Hayim. But if they don't receive what you're saying, Leave it alone. I know Casa's gonna go, I'm probably gonna go into some scriptures. <laughs> go ahead, we, we gonna you when I'm we gonna get into that here okay. in this teaching of that um just to nutshell it for the moment. You just spake on Gad chapter six, how to handle mm -hmm. that situation when someone trespasses so you can have the precepts. Leave it alone after they've not repented and also when you see they you're saying it and they deny deny it can't be or they may say yeah you're right but they're now stopping they continue in it it's unfortunate because that lust and fornication it blinds those passions actually blinds the soul so the person is just struggling to come out of it for you to have that understanding and with your knowledge how to edify and charity to just love, but not get into a passion yourself and then seek from Allah what ought to be done because they're variables to scenarios. Okay. Mm -hmm. Reach out to your counsel who, you know, keeps the commandments. And that is of a lot of importance because this arrogance and this, this pride and stuff that come over. If you look back at Hermes parable nine, it said, um, they praise themselves as having understanding. So a person will go and operate in their own understanding, yet they're actually senseless. And they don't have understanding. According to Job 28 and 28 or something like that, understanding is to depart from evil. So if you're not actually keeping the commandments, you don't truly have understanding from what the scriptures explain. And that person even coming out of the struggle with the pride and so on and so forth it says that they submitted themselves where is it at but some repented and believed and submitted themselves to those that had understanding having learned their own senselessness these people came to the place where they realized hold up i'm learning all this stuff but i'm not keeping the law what am i doing then they go submit themselves to those who have understandings by evidence of them actually departing from evil. So situations come up, variables come up, do nothing without discretion, 
Don't be excessive towards any and go speak to that counselor before every action to make sure you're doing what's right. And of course, pray to Allah Hayyam and wait for an answer. Okay. More specifically, they will learn a lot of things that wasn't helping them keep the commandments. So that's sure. why they have to go learn again from people that who, who have understanding of keeping the commandments and what it what it what was needful for one to be able to keep them. So thank you. That's for sure. Right. <clears throat> so hopefully that helps. Now seeing we can have we can be in the wrong inclination and operating like these evil spirits because we saw what we just talked about was that love, that false sense of love according to the world that isn't truly love from Allah Hayyam. And it's a spirit that's leading us into that inclination to help us know there really are two sides to this thing. Now, we're going to get into talking about the inclinations, the two of them. Think of it like the inclination of fornication versus the inclination of fidelity or faith, if you will. Let's talk about the inclinations that draw us either to the house of Allah Hayyam to operate like them or the enemy's house to operate like them. We have two ways of dealing in everything, and it's either the spirits or children from Allah Hayyam at work in us through the good inclination or the spirits or children of fornication and the devil at work through the evil inclination. As I was saying, think of it as fidelity to the law or spiritual fornication in the works of Belier for the two sides. Sirach 15 and 16, please. He yeah, set fire and water before thee. One side leads to the lake of fire and the second death. The other side leads to the living water and the Holy Spirit and baptism to come for those who shall enter the city of Christ. Okay. Stretch forth thy hand unto whither thou wilt. Before man is life and death, and whether him liketh shall be given him. We stretch forth our hand to the thing we like or desire, and that's what's going to be given to us. Understand our accountability and the part we play through our desires in the condition we are in, whether in the spirit of fidelity or of fornication. All right. That's similar to what Zach was talking about. That demon has to, what are you saying? They have to actually get us to do it. We have to actually do it. It's because of mm -hmm. us. All right. We are accountable in this. All right. Now, whether in the spirit of fornication or of fidelity, Allah Hayyam has given us two ways, these two ways, essentially, to choose from. Asher chapter 1, verse 3, please. Two ways have Allah Hayyam given to the sons of men and two inclinations. Inclination is a person's natural tendency or urge to act or feel in a particular way. All right, continue, please. And two kinds of action and two modes of action. Mode is a way or manner in which something occurs or is experienced, expressed, or done. All right, continue, please. And two issues. Our natural tendencies, urges, and feelings are either inclined to Allah Hayyam or Satan. And it's shown in the manner or way we express ourselves, experience things, or do things ourselves, either in fidelity of spirit or in the spirit of fornication against Allah Hayyam. Continue, please. Therefore, all things are by twos, one over against the other. So it's a constant war between the two ways against one another as things are by twos and one will always prevail over the other when weighing things out so it's for us to understand why we have to give all diligence 
and take our time in order to add up whatever we're doing or whatever we're thinking upon or whatever we're about to say, to be sure it adds up to fidelity and the good inclination. Because there's always a war between the spirit of fidelity and fornication at work in the two inclinations. Continue, please. For there are two ways of good and evil. This is the division of good and evil. It means that our works are either in good or either in evil when you weigh it out. All right. Continue, please. And with these are the two inclinations in our breasts discriminating them. So these two inclinations are in our hearts. And we're supposed to be taking our time to discriminate between the two to assess, to reason, and be sure whatever we're endeavoring upon or inclining unto is actually going to add up in the sight of Allah Hayyam to good, All right? So that we can be sure when we weigh out what we want to do or what we think, it sums up to fidelity in truth with singleness towards Allah Hayyam, and there's no fornication in it in any way. That's all right. Yes, in layman's terms, it has to add up. When you weigh it out, it has to be for Alahayim, and there can't be any part of it that's profiting yourself. Mm -hmm. For these reasons, let's see what Asher says in Asher chapter 6, verse 1, please. Take heed, therefore, ye also, my children, to the commandments of the Lord, following the truth with singleness of face. That's the spirit of fidelity operating, all right? For they that are double-faced are guilty of a twofold sin. That's the spirit of fornication working in the double phase, because one may be doing something, yeah, it's right for Allah, but there's also some desire for self whether it be how one might look or what a person is going to think of you and so on and so forth. There'll be some man pleasing or something like that. The double face at work. Continue, please. For they both do the evil thing and they have pleasure in them that do it. Following the example of the spirits of deceit and striving against mankind. So we see that false love is an example of the spirits of deceit to have pleasure in evil or evil doers. Spiritual fornication operating like spirits of deceit causes us to sin doubly in that we would do evil ourselves and have pleasure in evil doers just as Beelzebul was evil himself and had pleasure in his evil son by evidence of his supporting for him striving against mankind. When a person is struggling with the spirit of fornication, we'll be doing the same things. And hopefully that helps understand what or who is at work when we're doing wrong, supporting wrongdoing, or hiding wrongdoings for the sake of not wanting to offend when it could help keep someone accountable and change. Knowing the spirit of fornication side of things, we are encouraged to give heed to Allah side and perspective only in fidelity. Pastor, you want to know what's interesting? I do. The only way you can actually serve Allah in truth is if you're not a man pleaser. Because you have to be able to speak truth to your neighbor. And if your neighbor is doing something that's wrong, you have to be able to say something or else you become an enabler. I concur. It makes sense. Because but... if you don't say anything, then that means that you don't want to offend them. But you don't want to offend them in their wrongdoing. So that means that you're a respected person. You would rather offend Allah Hayyam than offend the person.
the ways up to sin because you shouldn't hate your brother in their heart and suffer sin upon them, but we should rebuke our brother and love our brother as ourselves. Amen. Continue in verse 3, please. Do ye therefore, my children, keep the law of the Lord, and give not heed unto evil as unto good. Don't give heed unto the evil of the world's ways as good. Or what the world calls good, taking pleasure in it, if it doesn't align with Allah Hayyam, because it's the spirit of fornication at work in it. That man pleasing is big. When we get Lord willing to that point, when we look at examples of people struggling with fornication, man pleasing is in there. Even that stubbornness and vain confidence with us went over about the being puffed up in knowledge. Man pleasing was in, no, it was self pleasing. Technically, you are man pleasing yourself. So it's in there. This hopefully is helping. Get understanding of what's going on and even shed an insight of what may be going on within as we need this understanding to be wise as serpents, to grow and become harmless as doves because we have a job, a calling to come out of this. Can you read Romans 12 and 2, please? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Allah I am. we need a renewal we need renovation Allah I am to give us understanding of the things we actually need to change so that we can start proving as we talked about slow down weigh things out prove what is that good acceptable and perfect will of Allah I am. does mm -hmm. this actually amount to good before Allah I am? for Allah I am. All right So let's rather let our focus be on to renewing our minds to what's good in the sight of Allah Hayyam, not ourselves and not another person. All right. And holding fast to that inclination and that good, even in the midst of doing the work or doing whatever it is that you're doing, you may see an opportunity for yourself to gain, like focus on what you're doing, what Allah Hayyam is told you to do or what you have seen that will add up to good for Allah Hayyam, that you be not tempted to be double-minded. Amen. Continue Ashes 6 and 3, please. But look unto the thing that is really good and keep it in all commandments of the Lord, having your conversation therein and resting therein. Shun the worldview or personal view and look unto what's really good in the commandments as that's the way to know what's really good as it is the doctrine of life. And keep it, though it may not be viewed as good in the world, and be on God as Zach was just talked about in the midst of things, not to find an opportunity or give heed to an opportunity to go away from that inclination of doing good for Allah Hayyam. All of this essentially means we know we are listening to the truly good side of things and keeping it when it's lawful in the commandments and in the manner or mode of the fruits of the spirit. And that's what we implement for our manner of life and conversation, resting in it, being unmoved from that position and that focus that is for Allah, Hayyam, not for ourselves. Even Yache did it. He humbled himself in being found as a man. He humbled himself even unto death for Allah Hayyam's sake to glorify him and fulfill his will. It's going to take time and it's going to take work examining things in us and in our life to find the truth and cleave to it, searching out the commandments to get aligned or make sure we're aligned with Allah Hayyam and then resting in that, to walk according to his ways, with all our strength in singleness of heart and mind, 
being that one honest, genuine person doing good in the spirit of fidelity for Allah Hayim. Um, Solomon said that the whole duty of man is to keep the commandments. So everything else really doesn't matter. Your job doesn't matter. Um, all these other things don't really matter. They're a part of your life, but they're not the focus of your life. Like, the focus of your life is keeping the commandments because that's the whole duty of man. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to, that's our life. Like, everything else is just a part of our life. So if you're not looking at it as the commandments, that right there is what I need to be focused on at all points of my day. And you're like, okay, well, I need to focus on this work. I need to focus on my job or whatever the case is. And that is the, like the main focus. You're going to fall because you're not focused on what is our duty. You're not focused on what the whole duty of man is. Like, even going back to what we were talking about as far as being lifted up in knowledge, you will be a fool to be lifted up in knowledge knowing that knowledge comes from Allah Hayyam. Like, if you're looking at it as you acquire something yourself, you're already going off of the path. Like, it's the mindset. It's the thanksgiving. Like, once you lose that thankfulness, it's hard to serve Allah because you start looking at everything as you as you did it you did it I did this once you get into that you're you're self-pleasing just as we talked about in the in, in the Shepherd of Hermes like you're going off of the path because you're not focused on the whole duty of man which is to keep the commandments like That's right. The apostles. I know we better go into it. Go, I'm sorry, guys. I know we better go into it. Asher five. Go ahead. Yeah, and just um, we have the apostles as well. They were not men pleasers. They didn't speak to please men, or in a cloak of covetousness, but they spake before Allah Hayyam. And they were focused on Allah Hayyam who weighed their conscience. And they were examples that we're supposed to follow, to know. Yeah, that's our whole duty. That's what life is about. Let's get on into it in Asher 5 and 4, please. All these things, therefore, I proved in my life. And I wandered not from the truth of the Lord. And I searched out the commandments of the Most High, walking according to all my strength with singleness of faith unto that which is good. You did what you were talking about. Daily in his life, searching out the commandments of the Most High to make sure he's walking in it with all his strength and that it was sum up to good. And being sure not to get caught in that moment, those lulls to wander from the truth of the Lord. Not to get caught off in the wrong thoughts or wrong inclinations. He understood the battle that we're in. And it's interesting, Asher, you remember the end of his thing? He told his kids, at the end of a man's life, you'll really know what's going on by the spirits that meet him when he dies. Mm-hmm. He knew what the real battle was. Keeping away from these spirits so that they don't have place in us in the end. Okay. If we're set on purpose, reaching out our hands to work to attain unto the good way that leads to that living water, that's how we will be in our life. Having pleasure in the good inclination, finding what's right to do in the law, 
and being strong to walk in it with a single set mind upon it to fulfill our duties. And when we do see something's gone well or we've done it, we'll remember we're unprofitable servants just doing what was our duty to do. Because we know it's Allah Hayim that's actually doing it anyway. If you don't have anything, Asher, one and six, please. Therefore, if the soul take pleasure in the good inclination, all its actions are in righteousness. Because the soul is focused on doing everything for Allah Hayim, not for self. That soul is actually taking the time to prove and reason and consider before taking action, getting counsel before action, to make sure the action is in the commandments and the fruits, and no fornication has place in the action, so everything will be a righteous action. Continue, please. And if it's sin, it's straightway repentive. For having its thoughts set upon righteousness and casting away wickedness, it straightway overthroweth the evil and uprooteth the sin. It doesn't do it because that's not its purpose. It knows what it's going for and catches that, oh, hold, that ain't right. Confess quickly. I apologize. Please forgive me and pay attention and work. When mistakes happen, repentance will be quick because the purpose of soul is to get it right for Allah Hayim and the righteousness in the law and fruits is what's on the mind to judge oneself, ensuring our works are entirely good before Allah Hayim in the spirit of fidelity so we could catch our own mistakes sooner or be willing to listen when a fault is pointed out. That right there is what perverseness stops you from doing. Stops you from repenting. Yes, sir. And with that breach in the spirit, fornication came in. Fornication despises the words of holiness or resents it. It's not going to hearken to a prophet or a righteous man. So... And yes. it's not going to repent itself because it's going to cover the fault. Yes, sir. Just as Asmodeus did. He justified what he did. Mm -hmm. We talked in lessons past about when somebody says something, Use the opportunity to reason and examine it. Like, hey, okay, let me think about it. Give me a chance to pray about it. Let me see. Let me make sure to know that if that has place in me or not. Instead of casting it off, like, nah, that can't be. Mm -hmm. okay. Gotta work righteousness. We need it. We need it to overcome. Test him to God, chapter 5, verse 3, please. Righteousness casteth out hatred. Humility destroyeth envy. For he that is just and humble is ashamed to do what is unjust. Being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because the Lord looketh on his inclination. For fearing, Least he should offend the Lord, but he will not do wrong to any man, even in thought. For true repentance after a holy sort destroyeth ignorance, and driveth away the darkness, and enlighteneth the eyes, and giveth knowledge to the soul, and leadeth the mind to salvation. And those things which it hath not learnt from man, it knoweth through repentance. So see where the good inclination leads unto salvation through repentance, where we're holding ourselves accountable 
in thought, word, and deed, not to do wrong to anyone, with fidelity to Allah Hayyam, having Allah Hayyam in mind and focus on pleasing Him, not ourselves. The good inclination is just and humble. And in that just and humble mindset, it looks like what we're about to read for a guide for aligning ourselves to it. If you would read Testament of Benjamin, you read this portion of chapter six, please. In this uh, verse one? Yes, sorry. Okay. The inclination of the good man is not in the power of the deceit of the spirit of Belier. For the angel of peace guideth his soul, and he gazeth not passionately upon corruptible things, nor gathereth together riches through a desire of pleasure. He delighteth not in pleasure, he grieveth not his neighbor, he sateth not himself with luxuries, he erreth not in the uplifting of the eyes, for the Lord is his portion. The good inclination receiveth not glory nor dishonor from men, and it knoweth not any guile or lie or fighting or reveling. For the Lord dwelleth in him and lighteth up his soul, and he rejoiceth towards all men always. The good man hath not two tongues, of blessing and of cursing, of contumely and of honor, of sorrow and of joy of quietness and of confusion, of hypocrisy and of truth, of poverty and of wealth. But it hath one disposition, uncorrupt and pure concerning all men. It hath no double sight nor double hearing, for in everything which he doeth or speaketh or seeth, he knoweth that the Lord looketh on his soul. And he cleanseth his mind, that he may not be condemned by men as well as by Allah Hayyam. And in like manner, the works of Belier are twofold, and there is no singleness in them. Hopefully that helps for a rubric or a guideline of being in a good inclination. Knowing that the Lord is looking on our soul because he gave us a duty to fulfill, to keep his commandments. And now that we got guidance to know that's our focus, we have to have him in mind that he's seeing our soul. There's nothing hid from him to make sure we're doing, thinking, speaking, everything that would actually please him. Is there anything in that? That actually does differentiate. Yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> It actually does differentiate so that you can know if you have a good inclination or not. Because it says, and in like manner, the works of Belier are twofold and there is no singleness in them. So if you have an inclination and there's only one purpose. And it's like, OK, I'm going to help that person cross the road. And that is the only inclination. And there's no other there's no other benefits to you. That's how you know you're in the singleness of heart. But if you say, I'm gonna help that person cross the road, and man, it's gonna help me cross the road. And man, I'm gonna look good helping them cross the road. Or once you once you start getting into any other things added on, you know that it's not right. Amen. Straight up. Praise Allah from that. This is good when we get a clear dichotomy of what it is to be in the faith or not. To be in fidelity or not. When you start weighing your pros, like that's when you know, hold on, something ain't right. This isn't single. Helping us become servants. We touched on earlier, our maker is our husband, right? He's the creator of Jerusalem and um, the children, Lord of all. Wives have to be subject to their husbands and everything. 
not seeking their own will. And as servants, children, we have to seek to please our parents, obey our parents in all things. So it's helping us to learn how to really serve. You know? Praise Allah. Amen. Now if fornication finds place and her children are at work, let's see how that evil inclination will cause us to operate. Asher chapter 1 verse 8, please. But if it incline to the evil inclination, all its actions are in wickedness. You may already know why, but let's see why is the actions going to always sum up to wickedness. Continue, please. For whenever it beginneth to do good, he forceth the issue of the action into evil for him, seeing that the treasure of the inclination is filled with an evil spirit. He had to force the issue to get a benefit for himself. It wasn't about Allah Hayyam only and doing it for Allah Hayyam. Forcing the issue into something that he would gain from or benefit from. That's how we know when all our actions are going to sum up to wickedness when it's for our own gain or for pleasing ourselves. So, <laughs> you know what's funny? <laughs> what I, Allah, I am said, I'd rather, uh, when they're talking about being lukewarm, he said, mm -hmm. I'd rather you be hot or cold, right? Mm -hmm. It's, I, I, I understand his sentiment <laughs> because it's either you're going to do it for me wholeheartedly and you're not going to seek your own or go seek your own. And leave me out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you're lukewarm. You're doing things for me and you at the same time when you might as well be just seeking your own. It's not a healthy relationship and he will. That's what he said. He'll spew you out. Right. You can't work with that when there's two can't have two masters trying to be a master of myself and then also say he's my master when I'm seeking my own will in the midst of anything he asks me to do. Gotta watch it. So we get to see all our actions will sum up to wickedness when we weigh things out because we would force the issue into something that's for ourselves are actually doing good for Allah Hayyam and his sake genuinely without self-seeking or self-pleasing and in spiritual fornication an evil spirit will be at work seducing and assisting us to transgress and commit some sin with an evil spirit in our inclination what else would we do in the evil inclination so we can know when the wrong spirit is at work in us Asher 1 and 8, please. And it driveth away the good, and cleaveth to the evil, and is ruled by Belier. Even though it were what is good, he perverteth it to evil. We will struggle to do good, not being inclined unto it, but we will be more consistent in evil, as is Belier ruling our inclination of soul. And if we do do good, or begin to do something good, we're going to turn it and force it into evil because we're going to turn it into something for us or about us. Fornication would get us away from Allah Hayyam to bring us near to Belier, withdrawn from the law that would have kept us near to Allah Hayyam, being inclined to the evil inclination under Belier's rule. Now, when under Belier's rule, we drive away the good inclination and the good in the commands, in humility unto Allah Hayyam, to do us right sincerely without self-seeking through our desire, our haste, our pleasure, our feelings, our passions, or our inability to be honest with ourselves in the midst of opportunities to do right. 
So everything we do, even when trying to do good, would be turned into evil when we force the issue to something for ourselves as it's about pleasing us rather than Allah Hayyam in this inclination. Also, when we do wrong, we would drive away the good of confessing our fault, but cleave to the evil of justifying our actions or avoiding accountability when our conscience weighs on us or someone corrects us. Also, if we do repent, it would be in hypocrisy by evidence of continuing in the sin, which will cause us to live with difficulty to keep the commandments. Fornication would be at work in this as it resents the words of holiness and won't listen to a prophet to be corrected and withdraws us from the law. This hopefully helps understand that anyone who struggles with the world concept of love in a family that supports each other and or their children in wrongdoing, being an enabler, or is just struggling with doing good altogether, is struggling with the evil inclination. Through the spirit of fornication, mother of all evils, as the evil inclination helps lead a person to be ruled by Belier, to be self-seeking in actions, rather than seeking the good for Allah Hayyam in his law, being selfless and single-minded on the duty of pleasing him by doing what's right unto him. In regards to the family relationships, as we touched on in the narcissist lesson, in a sense, whether parent, spouse, or child, if we support and or enable the wrongdoings of anyone in the household, it's the wrong spirits at work in us, leading us to do so. And we need to hold each other accountable in the household of faith and do right ourselves for Allah Hayyam's sake. And remember the peace we're called unto when we interact with each other, even when in a fault, the love we're called unto to restore someone in the spirit of meekness, to admonish someone in love or at the right time in love, doing all things for Allah Hayyam's sake, not our own. Anything else there, Zachbar? No, I'm good. All right. HRC, 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 HRC,